some new insight on the rash of terrifying abductions plaguing Gotham City. Warning, this footage may be too mature for younger audiences. The Dark Side. This thing is more important to you than your own son, Victor! Stop! Ah! No! I am entropy. I am death. I am Dark Side. Hi, my name is Jay Oliva. I'm the director of Justice League War, and with me is one of the most amazing artists I've ever had a chance to sit down with. I'm Jim Lee, co-publisher of DC Entertainment. I'm also the artist of the uh, comic book series Justice League Origins. What we're going to be doing for this uh, DVD Blu-ray uh, special feature is we're going to be looking at uh, a few clips and uh, kind of commenting on it. I'm going to ask Jim like his direction on how he did stuff, and then I'll mention a few things that we had to change or we adapted from the uh, six-issue series that this is based on, um, and we'll just go from there. So the first sequence we're actually looking at is the the way the book opens up, which is Batman chasing the the. In the comic book, it's we open up on Batman who's okay. chasing this kind of uh, raggedy uh, hoodlum. It turns out to be a parademon, and then he gets uh, stopped halfway uh, through the chase by Green Lantern. So you guys reversed yeah. the two. Yeah, we probably really... just because it's more dynamic starting with Green Lantern. I think visually. it's it's kind of nice that we start off, started off with Green Lantern just because of the fact that it kind of feels like. He's kind of aware of this threat, and he's in Gotham, which is kind of where he is not his kind of comfort right, zone. Right. And, and he thinks that what he's following is what is called the Batman, because no one's seen Batman at right. this point. And then it, that's very how we reveal. Uh, established that Batman's kind of an urban legend. Yes. And that we're at the very beginnings, the origins of the DC universe, where these heroes really don't know each other. Definitely. Okay. So that's why when Batman shows up right here, as you can see on the screen, it is a big moment for the fans because they're just going to be cheering. Sure. They're going to see this is a cool moment. And he does co come off more mysterious because uh -huh. he's a guy that kind of emerges out of the shadows as opposed to the guy you're following. Definitely, definitely. And one of the things I like about the comic as well, what we try to touch upon in the, in the movie was uh, the fact that these characters, when they meet, they don't automatically like each other. Turn it off. I had him. Clearly. Green Lantern is, he's like, I got a job to do. Batman's like, well, I got my own job. And it's not like they're going to be like, hey, let's be friends and, and fight on the same side. Like, they always have this kind of, they're always butting heads throughout the whole. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Jeff, Jeff Johns, the writer of the series, kind of thinks, thinks of the Justice League as this group of iconic heroes that they all get along and they're this uh, amazing team that are like family. And I think you really want to show the humanity behind each of the characters and establish that really with all these kind of A type personalities, you're going to have a lot of conflict and drama because they all are used to kind of getting their way. They're all used to uh, leading and uh, what happens when you put them all together and they have to come together to stop such a huge threat like Darkseid. And again, this is the beginnings of the Justice League so they don't all have to like one another. And eventually they can evolve to the thing that we kind of know in our minds to be the Justice League. So yeah, we had a lot of fun with kind of playing the characters off one another. They're mm -hmm. all foils. You know, obviously Batman and Green Lantern didn't get along. Green Lantern was a lot of comic relief. So it was just fun having um, that kind of personality and also just showing it for the first time. I mm -hmm. mean, of course, we've seen these characters interact before uh, pre New 52, but uh, again, we're, you know, everyone's suspending belief. It's all starting over and being able to establish the, the first beats where these characters meet one another. It was a lot of fun and a real honor to work on. That's great. We've seen Superman and Batman fight throughout the years, and it's very iconic. Well, the twist that you did in the comic book, like, well, how did you approach that? In the comic book, Green Lantern just walks in, and mm -hmm. then you see him, like, get thrown out and kind of burst through the protective cube that Green Lantern's put Batman in. And this one, you actually um, suggest this intense battle that's yeah. going on with all the lights and the smoke and explosions. And I think that's really cool because that's, that should have done that in the comics. That's really easy to draw, too, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. like, just sound effects, like, yeah, exactly. boom! Yeah. And smoke coming out yeah. of a building, I could do that all day, all night. And, yeah. uh, Ultimately, because this was the first time these characters met and fought, mm -hmm. I, I think what distinguishes this battle from others that, that fans might have read is that um, Superman's pretty badass. I mean, yeah. usually when you see him, the, someone's already got some sort of fail-safe device or krypton yeah. kryptonite ring or some way of beating him. And in this, I, I think he's pretty much an unstoppable force of yeah. nature. And, and you guys took it to the nth degree. 
in the comic book, uh, Green Lantern puts up this protective globe, mm -hmm. and, and Superman kind of bats it around and yeah. then flies to where it lands and smashes it, like basically showing that it's child's play for yeah. the guy, right? And and you guys took it even further and made this huge ping, pinball game yeah. <laughs> in the middle of uh, the city where he's literally just like bouncing the ball left and right all around. So um, Superman comes off really well in, in this fight. Fans like it when Superman kind of gets beat down, mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I've always been more of the Superman can take on anybody. I've done so many sequences where Batman and Superman have fought or been fighting together, or, right. or and and the thing is that I always try to find something new, a new twist to it. Like we've all know about the Frank Miller one and, and yes. everything, but the way I approach it is that I, li I like the way you do it, where Superman's a god. He's super fast. He's super strong. He's indestructible. But Batman is over prepared. Right. So he has like in this case, he's right. got he's throwing everything at sure, at, and at he Superman. doesn't give up, and, he and he's give, not uh -huh. scared, even though obviously, and Superman's very calm he's not in any sort of battle stance he's just like standing there because he knows like hey, this is exactly right. i'm sure there's some batman fans saying well superman would never get us get into this position and I, <laughs> I would say like well this is the first time uh, batman's ever actually encountered superman right. one on one so i'm sure if superman and batman ever got into a throwdown after this batman would be prepared sure. he'd have something to, to kind of you know uh do this uh, and one of the things i like about this sequence is was this your little homage to the whole superman being chained yeah yeah breaking the chains <laughs> that's funny uh, Neil Adams did a very famous one, but uh -huh. the, there was imagery even before then. I mean, Superman breaking the chains is part of his DNA. It's 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 a classic, and I think Jeff was probably thinking the same thing. And and uh, but I want to do it one step further, where obviously it's these uh, chains that Green Lantern has created, but also just create so many of them, mm -hmm. uh, and then have them come forth at you uh, almost so that the panel is like 3D. And so we did some blur effects to kind of create some yeah, depth yeah. of field, and. Uh, you know, you really feel like Green Lantern's just started. Like yeah. this is maybe his first six months on the job yeah. kind of thing. Well, even his constructs start to fail every yeah, now and right. then. Yeah, right. He has trouble concentrating. Batman recognizes I'm this. Serious. That's his real mm -hmm. fatal flaw at this point. So to me, this is not necessarily a fair fight amongst the icons because it's mm -hmm. they're not all at the same level of development yeah. at this point. So I was going to ask you, uh, when you and Jeff were coming up with this, did you guys make a constant, conscious decision to try to change Superman's personality than what he was in the past? Because I noticed he's a lot different. I yeah, mean, he's a little, uh, he's a little, got a little more of a banter, uh -huh. uh, you know. Uh, he's a little cockier, okay. uh, but but a quiet confidence, I think, more so, more more so than a cockiness. I think the cockiness is, is filled aptly by by Green Lantern. Um, but yeah, we wanted to do something a little different. Um, he's a guy that uh, probably at this point hasn't met anyone else as powerful as him, and um, you know he's younger, and mm -hmm. so um, both those things kind of manifest themselves in, in this more uh, headstrong personality. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Red, 98, hut, hut! Early on, was it a conscious decision to make uh, the first kind of six issues be an introduction to Vic's origin, to introduce him as Cyborg into the New 52? Yeah, I, I, it was my understanding, you know, that Jeff, uh, you know, he loves uh, Cyborg, he loves the character. Uh, obviously, he was part of the Teen Titans before. Um, but what we were missing from the Justice League was sort of the everyman's point of view, mm -hmm. of the novice to the team. Um, someone who was just coming into their powers. I mean, all the characters, for the most part, have already gotten their powers, even though they haven't banded together before. Victor's story allows us to have a guy that's essentially um, feels unloved by his father, uh, has this horrible tragedy happen to him, and then comes out sort of half machine, half human, a monster essentially, but he finds his humanity and he finds support and strength through uh, the camaraderie of the other Justice League members. And so that, that's a great story to tell. And it also nicely fits into the story beats of the Justice League themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. these are characters that, that are antagonistic towards one another. They unite, defeat Darkseid, and then decide to stay together because they realize that they are more powerful together than uh, the individual, individual mm -hmm. parts. One of the things that I, I try to do in this film is I try to tie together uh, Vic's origin to the attack from the uh, apocalypse by Darkseid and, and the parademons. So when that backwash of, of radiation comes out of the boom tube, yeah. it hits Vic and burns him. And so right. we, we took off an arm, we took off a leg, and just horribly scarred him. There's this moment where um, a Vic sees what is going to happen to Earth, where the parademons are going to take these humans and turn them into parademons. Right. And so I was, I, it was in, that was originally in the script, and, and I think it was in the comic too. Yeah. And I remember seeing like, that's a great origin for, for Vic. What if 
you know, Vic gets exposed to this radiation, but he's on Earth. And so when his dad takes him to the Red Room and tries to put, and he puts him in this iron lung, that he's trying to, to basically sustain his vitals. He doesn't know how he's going to fix them. He just right. sustains them. And he puts in, uh, you know, uh, some nanites into his bloodstream yeah. to kind of help repair it. But the idea that, that he was also exposed to this kind of, like, alien radiation, in my mind, the alien radiation is almost like... Uh, it has a it has an AI of its own, so right. it's AI. It's thinking, oh, I'm on a you know an organism. Right. I'm going to start to do the parademon process. Sure. So what happens is that it, the the tendrils come off of him and starts crunching the iron lung that he's in over himself. Right. Because we show it later on. That's what how it's done. But the only difference here is that Vic isn't being turned into a parademon on Apocalypse. He's being turned into a parademon on Earth. Right. And so therefore there. The signal is kind of getting messed up in the middle, and so what happens? That what happens is kind of like lightning striking, and something very unique happens. And what's born is is Vic, because right. it's a combination of the the, the right. virus as well as the technology that that his father has kind of put him right. in. I think in the comic, it's he's uh, almost killed by the radiation, mm -hmm. but it's his father that uses the technologies that they got to make him cyborg. We actually have uh, three different versions of him where he first comes out and he's like this gigantic right, yeah, Frankenstein yeah, looking yes. thing. But then as the movie progresses, he's starting to get a little bit more control of it yeah. and so he's able to actually uh, kind of morph. He it. slimmed down and yeah. then all of a sudden the blue lines actually formed a pattern exactly. as opposed to uh -huh. just, yeah, I yeah, saw And that. so what yeah, you saw is cool. you, you saw how he has a dark, uh, a darker armor. At the very end of the film, you actually see him in his, in his silver armor, right. in his, in his, uh, his white-ish. Because I want to show like there's this that's clear right. progression yeah. and that's how we ended up kind of going with that. As fans will notice that we are missing one of the key characters to the original team and they'll... The Wonder Twins. The, yes, the <laughs> Wonder Twins. Uh, and so do you want to kind of briefly talk about why we may have left Aquaman out and replaced him with yeah, Shazam? probably because Aquaman gets no respect, right? So <laughs> uh, I think um, what um, Shazam and Billy bring to the, to the movie is um, uh, a more youthful tone. I mean... It is a kid, and again, just the same way Victor represents the everyman and kind of our, our entree into this story, um, you know, Billy really brings a, a young person's point of view to it, and it, and it makes a character that's very different from others. It's not that Aquaman is not in it, because obviously there's a Easter egg at mm -hmm. the end that basically sets up more uh, adventures featuring Justice League and Aquaman. Um, so it's not that he's not here; it's just that he's not here at this particular time. And so I think it's the right creative decision awesome. because. Um, I've loved all of the, the scenes with, with uh, Billy and Shazam. I think he makes he has great interplay with uh, Cyborg mm -hmm. because they are kind of the outsiders to this other group of more adult, uh, somewhat experienced uh, heroes. And who the hell are you supposed to be, Mr. Roboto? Who I am doesn't matter. But what I know does. I think when I was a kid, I used to always call him Shazam because I sure. remember seeing that yeah. old that old uh, TV series that had him in it. Yeah, and, uh, Shazam and Isis. Exactly, right, and yeah. I would always just call him Shazam, even though it wasn't that was it wasn't exactly his name. Right. Um, so one of the things that we did in the movie uh, is uh, just like you said, he has the same power set as Superman, and so early on, I wanted I had this idea that well, you know. He'll still have the same process as said as Superman, but what if we gave him more of a more uh, outlandish treatment to his powers? You know, right. he's supposed to have he's supposed to be about magic. So I did the Big Trouble Little China treatment where I just had Raiden yes, power guess, going yeah. like a video game, like it's right. you know. And uh, well, that's another great thing that, that can happen in games and mm -hmm. animation is you can do those flourishes. It's very hard to do every single time you exactly. draw the character. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, trying but to... we try. I mean, we have been trying, been kind of pushing that envelope, and kind of trying to do it in. Photoshop and stuff. Uh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that we try to do with Shazam here is uh, try to give him where well, he's throwing lightning when he's punching there's there's lightning flashes yeah. just to give him more of a separation from Superman uh, so that when you see them two together uh, automatically the audience will know okay this is this guy and that's this guy and that way they are very different from each other as opposed to just being you know a clone just with different colors. That's awesome shot. Oh yeah, with and the, the boom when they all swarm on Superman. That's another <laughs> great shot. Just uh... yeah. So one of the things that uh, I think we ended up doing here, and it was in the comic too, how I like how it wasn't just 
Superman, uh, you know, beating the crap out of, of Darkseid. It wasn't just Wonder Woman or it wasn't Batman. Like, they all had their own little parts. Mm -hmm. All the way down to Vic, how they needed Vic to basically open up the boom tube right. and, and, and kind of seal it. Uh, here's a question that I, I want to pose to you that I always have a problem with whenever we're dealing with uh, team team kind of movies is that there's not enough screen time for everybody. Sure, yeah. You know, like, if you notice, like, this movie is very, you know, uh, it's very uh, Vic-centric and, and very um, kind of... Uh, Green Lantern, I would right. say. You, you see Batman, he still does some cool stuff. You see a little bit of Superman, and Wonder Woman actually has some pretty nice stuff here too, but do you have the problem, like, when you're doing the book, like, okay, I only have one panel to show this guy to do this. I mean, how, right. how, how is it juggling? Uh, it, this? It, uh, team books are a lot more work. Uh, you know, I'm working on Superman on chain now, which uh -huh. is, uh, you know, Superman, there, he's got secondary characters, so there are other people in there, but it's not like drawing the Justice League where a lot of times you have to draw all seven members in the same shot and they should all like be in different poses that it's reflective of yeah. their personalities and they can't all like look like they're standing the same way walking the same way so and they all have to look kick ass because they're the heroes none of them are secondary characters to one another so yeah it's, it's a challenge These defenders have sprung up like antibodies to protect their planet. We are in danger of losing the element of surprise, my lord. Let the invasion begin. He's here. Since we were doing the reboot and, and, and trying to come up with, with uh, this new look for the New 52, sure. how did you approach all these characters? Especially, like, I remember, like, this is the first time I've ever seen you do Darkseid, and I thought, when yeah. I saw the book, I'm like, this is really, really cool. Especially oh, thanks, the fact thanks. that yeah. he's gigantic. A lot of the DC characters are very humanoid size, so that the silhouettes of them are all very similar. Yeah. And so here was an opportunity, again, re relaunching the universe, rebooting it. What can we change to, to kind of make that um, uh, not so commonplace? And so characters like Darkseid or Doomsday, hey, here's an opportunity to make them. They're not humans. They are aliens. They're, uh, they are almost godlike. So what can we do? And so we start talking about making him much more massive and larger. How does that look uh, compared to the, the parademons and... And it just made for a visually more dynamic shot when you have all of them together mm -hmm. battling one another. But it's tricky, you know, when you have a character that can grab another character and hold them in yeah. one fist, it's how do you draw that and how do they interact and fight? It's almost you have to kind of, um, you have to really take the items, the objects in three-dimensional space and, and just kind of deftly maneuver them in your head and kind of cre create a way for people to uh, fight because it's very different than when characters are the same size. This world is mine. What else can we do? We send him home. For you as an artist, when you are choreographing the, that for the comic book, what I get as, an, as, as a director on the script, it usually says, cool stuff happens here, yeah, or sure, epic yeah, fight yeah, sequence. Yeah. So how does Jeff write? Does, does, he, does he just kind of give it out like this is a, this is kind of like a loose, and you come up with the uh, panels, or how, do, how is it in for, for comics? I always yeah, wondered about that. Uh, well, usually um, it, it runs the gamut from uh, just saying, you know, they fight to here, you know, here's what A, B, C, and D happen. A lot of times when, when they spell it out very clearly, it doesn't quite flow. A lot of the, the fight choreography in Justice League was something that um, I just kind of directed. Uh, there's a whole sequence where Superman fights the parademons and he takes the truck. Mm -hmm. You have the truck sequence, yeah. but he basically uh, crushes them, then pulls out the, the axle, and then yeah. uses the axle like a bat, and then the, the, the tires come falling down. Yeah. And he grabs them and throws them like discus, uh, disc guy, or disc, I don't yeah, know, disc, 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 <laughs> yeah. uh, against the parademons, and you see them come flying off into the ocean. And that was something I actually acted out for Jeff. Oh, uh, cool. I uh, said, hey, what if Superman did this? And I actually kind of showed him and he, yeah. and he liked it and that's why I went with I mean that's the benefits of working in the same office uh -huh. together you've had your work adapted before in animation yeah so how does it feel having it again adapted uh, it, it's pretty cool man I it, it's, it's 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 flattering you know um, and it's also it's it's uh, it makes it almost like a game for me because uh -huh. I'm like kind of looking through and I'm like oh I know where they got that and, oh why did they change this yeah. it makes it hard to watch it as like a you know as like a typical reader or fan would because mm -hmm. It takes you out of the story when you're looking for things like that. After I've kind of gone through it a couple times and looked for like Easter eggs like that, I'll just sit back and kind of enjoy it for what it is, which is an awesome story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I really hope you, you enjoyed it because, uh, I mean, myself and a lot of the guys on the crew are, again, huge fans of you. And the fact that we were able to translate what you and Jeff had done, you know, was a big honor as well as, you know, like you mentioned, like whenever I can see a composition or a panel that you had done, I'm like, 
that's that's a that's a perfect shot. Let's right, just right. keep it. Oh, this you know? is my first DC adaptation, and I've uh, been working at DC since 1998. So, wow. Yeah. Well, keep pushing for more stuff. Sure, I would love to guys. adapt hey. more of your stuff you know, along cool, the way. Man. So yeah. cool. It was nice meeting you, Jim. Hey, nice meeting you, Jeff. Cool. All right. See you guys later. Hope you guys enjoyed the uh, um, special features and uh, keep supporting the DC Universe and the DC Comics lines. All right, guys. I'll see ya. Unassimilated data detected. Download initiated. Great to see you. Oh, yeah, and that's Batman. Batman's real? Yeah, he's over there. <laughs>